Or here's a joke to do to your friends or strangers. Hey, do you guys know Sarah? Uh, Sarah who? She doesn't have any arms. <laughs> no, I don't know Sarah. Oh, well, knock knock. Who's there? Not Sarah. Hajime! <laughs> Brad would go to strangers and ask that joke for hours at a time. On a side note, I got these big ass glasses at Target. Yes, I did. <laughs> Another one of my favorite jokes came from a kid at karate camp. I did karate ever since I was 10. I got, no, 7. I did karate ever since I was 7. I got my black belt at 10, my second degree at 12, and my third degree at 16. And then I just kind of stopped. I'd come back and do karate camps every once in a while. So this little girl comes up to me and she goes, What? What is a pirate's favorite letter? And I look at her, I'm like, oh, I've heard this one. It's R. And she goes, No, you think it'd be R, but it really the C. <laughs> then she did the whole voice and everything, and she was like six years old. Made my day, became one of my favorite jokes ever. So another week of training is in the books. I did three neuromuscular days, two general days, and one extensive tempo day. The neuro days are like acceleration, plyos, and weights. And they kind of just kick your central nervous system. My mom has been determined to learn how to run. So that's been fun every Monday. I try and teach her how to run. And it's kind of difficult with a 50 year old who has a training age of zero. Get lower. <laughs> lower, butt higher than your shoulders. Yep, get on your heel on your front foot. My mom has never trained or ran, so it's like training um, an elementary school child sometimes. <laughs> She's gonna get mad at me that's that. <laughs> also, my dog has been a very good training partner. Well, I just did that workout wrong again. I had a 200, 150, and 100 times two, and they're supposed to be in 30, 22, and 15, and I ran them in 26, 17, and 12 and my legs are hurting because of it and then the general strength circuit after that was even worse thank god for my workout buddy huh squish yeah workout buddy i'm gonna go back to just eating this plant mm -hmm. it was faster than last week when i did it wrong <laughs> so i got that going for me he calls me out when i rest too long by shaking on my leg looks like i'm taking too much rest he's ready to go He knows when I go into oh, like a three-point stance, it's time to run. Like he can't see, so he listens for my footsteps. <laughs> so sometimes he just stands in the lane, waiting to hear the footsteps. Yeah, for a blind dog, he's pretty awesome. He's my buddy, me and Squish, we're pals. So I got a question on my Twitter account from Ethan Dinelli. I hope I'm saying that right, or maybe it's Italian. Hey, it's me, Ethan Dinelli. <laughs> he goes, you should make a video covering training shoes and jumping spikes. All right, so there's two types of shoes you are training in. You have cross training shoes, which are like these. You have pole vault spikes, which are like these. And then I guess if you want to throw a third one in there, you have everyday walking shoes, which I wear these because I like skater shoes. So the most important part when picking a cross training shoe, which are the shoes you will be in the most while you're training, is to make sure you have the right shoe to fit your foot. There are three types. You can get pronated shoes, supinated shoes, or neutral shoes. Shoes for pronated feet are when your feet, when they turn inward. So as your feet turn inward, you want a shoe that supports that and gets them back to kind of neutral. Supinated shoes do the complete opposite. Supination is when your feet end up like this. And you're going to want a shoe for supinated feet that shoes back to neutral. And if you have neutral feet, like this, you're going to want a neutral shoe. 
Because if you have the wrong shoe, you're gonna get this pronation or supination. So you need to be careful with what shoes you purchase. The best example I have this is, is for a long time, I just got the ASICS 2100 while I was in college. Awesome. Everyone else on the track team has this. Everyone's doing it and they must be good. And they look cool. Yeah, they look great. So I got them. And I had shin splints. And I had hamstring issues and all sorts of issues. It's because later I found out while I was getting my master's degree, while I was trying to figure out how to fix myself, that I had neutral feet. But I was wearing pronation shoes. It was making my feet super supinated. You need to have the right shoes and that will definitely help issues you have. When I get shoes now, I just tell them, I need three pairs of the Asics Cumulus or Nimbus. Because those are the neutral shoes that Asics makes. And I don't even look at the box. Take this box, and I'm like, all right, I got my couple pairs of shoes that I need for the year. And then I open it up and I got these. These might be <laughs> the ugliest shoes. There's glitter on them. <laughs> I've never had shoes with glitter on them. There's glitter on them. I don't care about looking good. I just want to make sure my feet don't hurt. Because I always say you're going to look good when you clear higher bars anyway. There's glitter on them. But I'm going to wear the crap out of these shoes. So to get the correct shoe, you're going to need to find somebody who can help you with your foot gait. If you go to a running store, a good running store, a store that's specifically set for like running, those people are good at watching foot gait and knowing what shoes you need. Um, and they will help you. Another way to look is if you have just shoes you walk in all the time, you can see where they are starting to wear out. If they are starting to wear out on the outside of your shoe, you probably supinate a lot. If it's kind of the back of the heel to the front, kind of like a diagonal line, you are probably neutral. You have a neutral foot. If you are on the inside and a lot of wear is going on on the inside, you over pronate and you're going to need some shoes to help with that. So that's kind of a, a quick way of looking at it and trying to figure out what you're doing. So check out your normal walking shoes and that can help you. Spike. Spikes are made to put you up onto your toe. Because we are sprinters. But the difference with us and why you should not wear sprinting shoes is that we jump also. There is a penultimate step where you are rolling from your heel to your toe. So I have had really good luck wearing triple jump spikes because there's a wider heel and it makes it so it's a little more stable while you're jumping. And secondly, there's a little more cushioning in the heel as well. So if you're a pole vaulter and you have a lot of heel pain, uh, maybe you need a triple jump shoe or something with a little more heel padding. Spike wise, pole vault spikes usually make pretty good spikes. There's, they're a little thicker in the heel, a little thicker in the sole. Uh, they have a pretty good spike plate and they're able to pull you up on your toe. I mean, they're made for pole vaulters, but the most important part is you gotta find what fits your foot and what you feel comfortable in. Just because the elites are wearing something probably doesn't mean it's the best for you. I could never do Nike stuff. It was just too tight, rubbed weird. So my favorite spikes that I have ever used are these Adidas ones, and that's what I keep using. Until maybe someday I get sponsored by somebody and I don't <laughs> have to buy spikes anymore. The Adidas ones have been great. Uh, the Adidas triple jump ones are awesome. The Reebok triple jump ones that I used to use, those were awesome too. Um, there's my stint on spikes. The other day I was, I have a prehab routine I do every morning when I wake up. It's to help with my shoulders because I've had shoulder surgery and I don't want it to ever hurt again. So I make sure I do it in the morning before I eat. <laughs> and I was thinking about it, I was like, I train probably three hours minimum a day, and then I, that's not counting the prehab stuff. There's two things. Where does my motivation come from and how do I keep it? My failures. My failures have been my biggest motivation thus far, and I have had a lot of them. High school, it started where my sophomore year I didn't make state by six inches. I jumped the same height every single meet the whole entire year. So I trained really hard through the summer that next year, which was my motivation because of the failure, and I made it to state. But then that next year, I got fifth at state when I, was, I wanted to place top three, at least. And so by doing that, it motivated me to train even harder the next year and start a little sooner in my summer training. Next year I had the highest vault in the state of Minnesota. But uh, fell short from winning state because I sprained my ankle two weeks before state and got second at state on misses. The same thing happened through college, you know. I, I know I did at our first conference meet. Pissed off, I trained really hard through that next year uh, to never let that happen again, and then I ended up winning it. 
but I didn't make regionals. <laughs> you know, it was all these little failures. You know, I can say a thousand of them. Uh, um, I didn't make the Olympic trials, but I jumped the height a week after after the deadline. There's just all sorts of stuff like that. It's these failures that I've had in my life, just like last year. Try and make the world team. I didn't even make it to U.S. champs. I missed it by one spot. There's my motivation again. If I win everything right away, or if I achieve everything and it's easy, I don't think I'd still be pole vaulting. So failure has been my biggest asset for me, and it continues to push me and motivate me to train. More importantly, how do I keep the motivation? Because failures, if you just fail all the time, you're not going to be motivated. You're going to be like, F this, I'm out. I'm taking my glasses and leaving. Uh, the progress is what keeps me motivated. And there's a lot of it. It's whether I'm getting a little bit faster in my testing with my sprints, it's whether I find something that helps my shoulders feel better, and I'm like, well, if I feel better, I'm going to do better next year. Or if it's, wow, I pull vaulted a little higher. Or, hey, I'm thinking, I think I fixed something with this vault. Or I held an inch higher on the pole. There's all these little things you can look at that add up. And it's never one big thing that makes something big. It's a combination of a million little things that make the end result. So it took me a long time to learn that, but it's a little bit faster and a little bit more flexible and a little bit smarter and a little bit more balanced with my body and it's just a little bit more knowledge with the right shoes and right poles and a little bit. It's just all these little bits. If you take a bunch of them, it adds up to something big and that's how I look at training. Progress is what keeps me motivated. It's the little things that make the big things. They all add up and it will show. I promise you. I've never seen it fail. But if it does fail, just use that as motivation. <laughs> like always, please subscribe on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Sean Danger Hoot, because Danger is my middle name. I'm also on Facebook. Please friend me. I like friends. If you want training written by a pole vaulter with a master's degree in health, nutrition, and exercise science, and a ton of knowledge on biomechanics because he wrote his thesis on it, then all the info is in the description. And that will guide you into your path to have me write you training. <laughs> Last week, I said, hey, I'm running out of workout clothes, and they're all getting holy, and the more I wash them, the more seats you they get, and before you know it, I'm going to be running around pole vaulting naked, and nobody wants to see that. If you are a business, a club, a fan, anybody, and you would like me to wear your gear, send it to me. I'm a size medium, and you know what? It took less than a week for someone to send me a sweet, badass shirt. It's my first pink shirt. The Fighting Artichokes, and it's really cool story. I got a sweet letter from it too. I was talking a lot about motivation earlier and this motiv motivated me beyond words. I'm just gonna try and sum this up pretty quick but anyways there was a track program who was on the verge of being cut. The Fighting Artichoke. Their school colors are pink and green. They had their last year and they all got together and they were like we're gonna end this year with a bang and we're gonna show it that you dropping the program is a terrible mistake. And I have this huge letter and I'm not doing it justice. They had to adapt and overcome. They trained hard and they lifted hard and they worked really 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 hard and uh, Jacob floors at nationals he jumped a PR at the biggest meet of the year on his third attempt to take fifth place and get on the podium at nationals and at the end his coach said how does it feel to be the last person on the podium to wear the scottsdale uniform and he said pretty damn good and i feel honored and privileged to be wearing this awesome shirt thank you jacob for giving me workout attire because i was seriously running out and yeah the offer still continues if you want to send me stuff I'm more than happy to oblige. Lastly, if you want to be in the intro, just send me a video and I'll throw you in there. All right, until next week, ask me questions, follow me on Twitter, do all that fun stuff, and I'll try to get back to you. All right, Sean, out. There's glitter on him. So, there's a new team. It's me, Leslie Bross, Sam Sonberg, Jack Samanza, Ben Peterson.